I'm Annika Frier, a German designer. I live in Offenbach, that's near Frankfurt. And I work as a teacher at a German design school. And I'm also a researcher. So I do research about design. And I'm also a designer myself. So there's a link between observation of other designers' work and my own design work in, yeah, in my process. My name is Ita Yohali. I'm an Israeli designer based in Eindhoven for the last years. I graduated uh, from the contextual department in, uh, of the Design Academy Eindhoven and I also have a bachelor degree in industrial design. Um, as a product designer, I mostly deal with systems and methods in design. So I'm Eugenia Morpurgo, I'm Italian. I did my bachelor in Italy in Venice and then I moved to Holland to do the master in social design at the Design Academy Eindhoven and now I live and work in Eindhoven. Um, I'm Juan Montero. I'm a London-based designer. I did my bachelor's in the UK at the University of the Creative Arts. And I met Eugenia in Eindhoven. We did the master's together, social design. And, uh... Okay, my name is Tal Erez. I'm an uh, Israeli designer and design researcher. I'm a graduate of the contextual design department at the Design Academy Eindhoven. And I'm currently based in Tel Aviv. Uh, so, my name is Thomas Vailly. And I'm, uh, I'm French, um, and after a few years, like five years of studying mechanical engineering in France, um, I decided to, that I needed something more hands-on. Uh, so I went uh, to study um, conceptual design at the Design Academy in the Netherlands. Uh, and then I stick around for uh, now more than two years. I set up my own practice and I do process design. Okay, so hi, my name is Thomas Lomé. I'm a Brussels-based designer, and in my practice, uh, we don't only try to consider the object, but we actually try to consider the object system. So that means actually uh, the design of the object, but also the design of the services around the object. So both the hardware and the software uh, as a whole form the system. I'm showing a mind map in the exhibition, The Machine, um, the mind map for me is a tool, actually, and um, it's not an image or a system or a material. It is a tool because I'm using it uh, for my PhD thesis. I, over the last two years, I collected a lot of examples from different designers all over Europe. Um, and I was searching for improvisation in their design processes. And um, this map shows exactly what is the point of improvisation in their process and how it's linked to the theories. Because I've read a lot of books in the last two years and they um, all have to do something with improvisation or the creative process or experimental processes. And I had to link the theories and the examples. Uh, in the exhibition I show two projects. The first is uh, about uh, taking back control of design and uh, making uh, production lines, which is a way to gather the uh, full um, elements of a design process, which is uh, making, uh, uh, making the machines, uh, showing the process to your audience and interacting with the audience, and uh, eventually sell your project. So it's uh, one system that uh, unites all these elements. The other project is uh, Design and Chaos, where, where I actually uh, release my control over the process. So I ask people to do different phases uh, of the process without them knowing what they are doing. And this uh, created uh, uncontrolled, unpredicted and surprisingly surprising designs. Um, we are presenting Don't Run. It's an open interactive uh, production line for shoes. It's uh, the development of a previous project uh, that we worked on uh, during Cifabric, uh, an exhibition during Dutch Design Week last year. Uh, that was more of a um, theoretical approach to production. And now we are trying to, to bring uh, this pair of shoes, uh, this, uh, this product, uh, to a more commercial level, but still uh, trying to keep uh, all the, the different way of uh, producing in the process uh, that we developed in the previous exhibition in the, in the shop context. Uh, well, uh, Waiting for the People is a series of billboards, each one with an image that hints at a possible uh, future under this uh, new industrial revolution, this uh, new 
digital production uh, future. And uh, they are categorized under four themes, at least on the research level, which is materials, production, distribution, and authorship. And in the research part for this project, the main uh, perspective was the connection between technological changes and social changes and between uh, worker groups and political power, which dates back to the guilds, moves to the Industrial Revolution, and uh, as this project tries to uh, highlight, maybe kind of offers this new political power again to the new production community, which is uh, consumers. And that is why also uh, the setup of the billboard that maybe tries to hint that there is a political power waiting to be taken under these new premises. So I'm showing two projects, two process design projects. Uh, one is called the Metabolic Factory. Uh, so basically it's, um, I just look at how metabolism uh, works, and especially my own metabolism, um, and I use keratin, so hair. Uh, I transform it into a bioplastic um, that looks a bit like leather. Um, so that's one of the projects. Uh, the second project is called uh, the Creative Factory. Um, so it's a production line where you see every step uh, of a process. And this process is to, uh, I use a latex balloon, uh, so very flexible, and I, I, um, I shape the balloon by pulling, and then I inject resin inside, roto mold it, and after a few hours the, you get very organic and uh, glossy shape. So I, from that I make vases or tables, lamps. So actually, uh, the Open Structures Project investigates the potential of an open modular system. And what we mean by that is we uh, is a kind of mechano that works according to the Wikipedia model. So it's a kind of a modular system that, that is not uh, constructed and designed by one company, but actually by uh, as much contributors as possible. Yeah, um, the improvisation can be a tool and not so much a material. And in my theory, it's like it's more like a system because it's um, yeah the right, the theory itself always has something systematic, and there is already the problem because improvisation can't be systemized or analytic. It's always something that happens because of many reasons, it, and it's always very specific. It always has a certain context, and that's why I have a lot of specific examples I'm observing. Yeah, when in general, when um, you deal with systems, so in a way you take a step back for the actual design of an object, but you create more possibilities. So when you have a system, you, you just create possibilities. You, you create the space for other people to go in and make their own products. And um, when you do a system, it leads to maybe hundreds of design uh, products or uh, objects and uh, rather than uh, just making one design, a chair, for example. So this is what led me to, to deal with the method and systems. It's interesting. me. I mean, it ticks a lot of boxes. Uh, it stems from Eugenia's initial project, and the heart of that project was reparation, and the idea that if you learn how things are made, you're more likely to repair them, take care of them, respect them. Uh, a lot of principles that we thought were important for this particular project, and that are kind of a an integral part of it. And we use prototyping technology like a laser cutter um, for small scale production. So we're limited by the quantity of what we can do, but actually what that offers us in return is a really great interaction with the people who do partake in the project, who are a part of the assembly, who are a part of the choices being made, and that ranges from the designer to the consumer. Um, and really what we do is uh, we kind of guide it and we get other people involved shoe designers, graphic designers, people who are really happy to help with the project actually. Um, and this small scale production economically for someone like us, we, we haven't really got that much money. So we're using prototyping technology for production. Um, so we reduce costs, we don't have to get prototypes made somewhere else, we don't, we don't import, we don't... We have a full control on uh, the materials and on the outcome in all the steps of the production and also in the way we, we want to 
uh, have the, the consumer get in touch with the project, with the product itself. The consumer can be part of the production itself. Well, they're an integral part. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're the assembly. They, are, <laughs> they take care of that. Of putting it together, but they're there from, uh, they can see from, uh, from the raw material until the end. It's totally transparent. I mean, really, from the point of the material being there, you selecting it, you meeting the designer, you understanding the sheet that that designer's put forward, watching it cut, and putting it together, there's nothing hidden. Even the costs are in a pie chart which explain the breakdown of the shoe. So we, we, we're even thinking about charging the shoe based on the weight of the material and the time it takes to cut it. So even that part is decided on, on really realistic um, scenarios. And trying to eliminate completely waste because uh, the raw material stays as it is until there is a real demand for the product. That it's something that doesn't really happen. Yeah, so we eliminate storage, so we can fit into a room this size, have a machine in the corner, some materials, and somebody can come in and we can create a shoe in half an hour. And the shoe is just an example. We needed to start from something that we had a product that worked good with this type of system, and so to communicate and to bring it to the public, the shoe is the first product. But we see how it, with those technologies, it's very easy to adapt it to a lot of other typologies of products. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the more I dive into the, uh, to my research, the more I see uh, how political this, this idea of design is, this profession is. And I think the more I research into this idea of home production and 3D printing, but digital production in general, I see that it really shakes the system that we live in, the system, the economic system, the social system, the political, the political system. And I think it actually holds a lot of responsibilities uh, for the designer, which now is so many of the elements of the production chain being uh, digitized, distributed, he actually goes up and up uh, in the pyramid, to the top of the pyramid, but also gives a lot of power to consumers. And I think my work in general on this one, maybe in the most specific way, tries to kind of highlight or put a spotlight on this idea. Um, I think both for consumers and for designers to, to understand maybe the, the responsibility but also the, the power and the options uh, uh, they now hold, the opportunities it holds. I think the, the, the future of home production and what it holds within it is in many ways a very political one and it gives uh, a lot of opportunities and responsibility both for designers and for consumers uh, in their power to make change for better and for worse. And I think this project specifically uh, tries to highlight this idea and to make both designers and consumers aware of their responsibility and opportunities. I think the why of the, the I do process, it's not, there is no why, I am fascinated by process. It's what I learned from my mechanical engineering education and it's what I do. But when it becomes more tricky is the system in which this process uh, work. So these two projects are two attempts uh, to define systems. One system very intimate, my own body as a system, and uh, one system very global, like the entire production system. So um, that's where I try to find the why. That's what I try to redefine. Okay, so why do we want to do this? There are actually three main reasons why we want to do this. The first one is from an ecological perspective, because modular objects, they're more resilient to change, they're easier to adapt, they're more flexible. And from a social perspective, um, it has the potential, like an open modular system has the potential or the capacity to, uh, it makes it easier to build things together. And from an economical perspective, an open modular system uh, also opens up new opportunities to create new services around the second life economy, around reuse, recollection and reconfiguration. And as a whole, this system therefore um, could be a way uh, of designing and building things in a more sustainable 